Good morning. Listen, y'all gonna have to give me more than that because uh, I was up at 6 a.m. this morning. I had an extremely long day yesterday. As Karen mentioned, um, uh, the organization uh, that I currently run celebrated its 10-year anniversary yesterday, and so we were from morning dawn until late at night. Um, but I'm so happy to be here um, with you all. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Um, so Women of Color in the Arts is, a, is an organization that's dedicated to creating racial and cultural equity. We do this in a myriad of ways, but it's really about support to arts leadership. Um, we hold space specifically for women of color um, that are working in the arts in a variety of, of positions um, as curators and producers, as executive directors and festival um, promoters. Um, but the, the biggest thing to, to take away from, from our work is that we are creating paths so that um, we all, every one of us, can have access um, to the arts in a, in a way that is equitable for all. Um, so I've been very privileged, I'm very privileged to be here and come and speak with you all and engage in this dialogue. I feel privileged and honored to be at the Jazz Congress. Um, I wanna start off by saying any space that WOCA enters, we always began with acknowledging the land. So I wanna take a moment um, in order to do that. Um, we always begin with the practice of acknowledging the indigenous people of the land, a practice we began several years ago. Um, in this particular case, we want to honor the Lenny Lenape, who's, on whose stolen land we now occupy, in which this place is called New York City. The Lenny Lenape are broadly acknowledged as being the stewards of this land, um, but we should also recognize the Manhattan, the Canarsie, the Shinnecock, the Muncie, the Matinecock, the Setauket, the Ungchang, and the Montauket, who inhabited the area that we now call New York City. And so contrary to popular belief in this romanticized history that we've all been fed in these United States of America, this place that we stand, this ground that we stand on literally is, un, is, um, is, stolen, land, is stolen land whose resources we pull from every single day. So we do this not only to acknowledge um, these tribes' historical sacrifices, but their modern day ones too. Woka acknowledges land in order to show honor and respect. We understand that in this country, that is just a very small step towards uh, reconciliation. It's a very small step towards recognition. It's a very small step to, towards reconciliation. It's a very small step to liberation. But as an organization that is dedicated to um, creating racial and cultural equity, we cannot step into a space and not authentically acknowledge the narratives of people's history. So thank you for taking that time with me, giving me that, that space. And I really encourage you, as you go back into your own communities, to begin this practice as well. It's a small step, but it's the first step. So um, let's talk about today's forum. Here we are, Jazz Congress 2020. Um, this session is called um, Women in Jazz women in jazz. Um, but the, the title really should be called um, Inequalities Faced by Women in Jazz Due to a System of Patriarchy and Racism. <laughs> Inequalities in Jazz Faced by Women Due to a System of Patriarchy and Racism. Y'all feel me on that one? And even then, I think that inequality really doesn't doesn't nail it. Um, it's really about this perpetuation of inequitable systems which have historically kept women from receiving their appropriate due. Yeah? 
Um, so I know that this is being live streamed, so for those listening at home that don't have the program in hand, I just wanted to quickly read the description that I, that I crafted for today's forum. And it says, from Lillian Harden and Ella Fitzgerald to Terry Lynn Carrington and Esperanza Spaulding and jazz music, women have helped to shape, innovate, and serve as agents of change. But the disparity in opportunities for women speaks to the oppressive nature of institutional inequities that now only exist, that not only exist in the jazz industry, but in the world. Uncovering how these inequities manifest from our discriminatory hiring practices to the way um, to pay inequities is just the first step towards advocacy. However, advocating for gender equity requires an intersectional approach, and we're going to talk about that. I'm sure it's going to come up, an intersectional approach to looking at both, at how both sexism and racism impact opportunities for all women. So this town hall, we're hoping, is creating a dialogue to help um, empower and advocate for women. But began to answer the question, what do we need in order to create equitable spaces for women in the jazz industry? Now, I said begin to answer, because there's no way that we're even gonna breach the surface in 70 minutes. It's not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. Um, but I believe that this, uh, hopefully that this dialogue can spark other dialogues throughout the conference experience over these next two days and when you go back into your, your respective communities. So um, I, I, I know that today's keynote today, um, later today is about the incomparable Betty Carter who, um, I, to my understanding, carved her own path um, in music, taking great pride in having real ownership over her music, her voice, and her image. Um, things that oftentimes can feel like a luxury or a gift um, for many of the women that are traversing uh, the field. But I thought it would be really helpful um, before we get into the heart of it to just go over like some key terminology that's gonna, that I'm going to say and I'm sure is going to come out um, in the conversation today. So I wrote, if we could pull it up, um, some of the vocabulary that may, that may come up throughout the day. Let's see if they, they have it on the screen. The first one is uh, it's about patriarchy. Y'all heard that term before, right? Because I just used it. <laughs> it's a social system in which men primarily hold power and dominate women in roles of leadership, authority, social privilege, and control. And it's a system, like most systems of oppression, that we perpetuate, all of us, consciously and unconsciously. So that's one very important thing. Um, some of the key expressions of patriarchy is um, it holds up the traditional male qualities as central while other qualities are considered subordinate, right? And so that attributes of power, control, authority, extreme competitiveness. Those are um, examples of traditional male roles and then those, that emotional expressiveness, compassion, ability to nurture, those are attributed to traditional female roles. How many of y'all have seen that played out in the jazz world? Yeah, okay, I know you have. So the next, um, the next way in which patriarchy is played out is this dualistic and gendered thinking um, of roles. And so within this structure, men and women have their very specific roles. Men are leading and women are supporting. How does that play out on the bandstand? <laughs> Even though this way of, of being is, is we're, we're, we're progressing, we're moving forward. Um, it's clear that certain careers, certain pathways, certain ways of being are associated with women. Um, and disproportionately, they have lower salaries, 
pay gap, disparities in pay. Um, the third way in which patriarchy plays out is male domination. Men often occupy the most important um, and visible roles, the executives, the politicians, the public leaders, the speakers. Women who hold these positions are expected to subscribe to male norms. And that's why I say oftentimes we can, even as women, unconsciously uh, perpetuate this system of patriarchy. And then um, the last one is this reinforcement of other types of oppression. Patriarchy um, also contributes to racism and classism and sizeism and homophobia, all those other systems. So I think the most important thing, and do I have it up here? Uh, patriarchy is generally not explicit, an ongoing effort by men. It's, 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 it's really not that about trying to dominate women. And sometimes that is the narrative that we hear. It's a long standing system that we are born into and participate in mostly unconsciously. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your head, mostly unconsciously. So I had some other terminology. It'll come up on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, Y'all can pull it up now if you want to about racism and some of the other systems of oppression that may come up in our talk today. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest two things that I wanted to um, just ground us in before we, we move for, forward into the open dialogue is this, these ideas about equality and equity. Equality and equity. So equality, and sometimes people don't know that there is a difference between the two because I think in everyday life we use those terms interchangeably, yeah? Um, but equality aims to ensure that everyone gets the same things in order to thrive. Equality aims to ensure that everyone gets the same things in order to thrive. But equity aims to understand what people need, what people need. Um, in order to, draw, to, to enjoy full and healthy lives. It gives them the tools that they need in order to thrive. Do y'all understand that distinct, distinction? So that's why I said, you know, I don't even think in, inequality hits it on the head when I, when I rewrote today's, uh, the title of today's program. Um, so, <sighs> I want to open the floor for some discussion, and I know that Jazz Congress had sent out some information about what was going to take place here and offered um, a space for you to kind of think about, um, sit with, and answer the questions that we pose for today. Um, before that, but before we get into the heart of it, what I want to do is talk about some of the shared community agreements that I want to have in this space before we open up. How many of you have worked with community agreements, know what that is? Yeah, great. So community agreements are not rules per se, but they're the way in which we're going to engage in this space in an open forum, a town hall of sorts. Um, they show us how to be and how to show up for our fellow participants. Um, so if y'all can put those up on the board, yeah, that's helpful. So um, one, step up and step back. That means give everyone the opportunity to speak. If you're normally the person in the room that has the biggest voice, that talks the loudest, is the most articulate and you know, likes to go on, yeah, don't be that person today. <laughs> <laughs> no, be that person. No, I'm just kidding. You can be that person, but give other people the opportunity to speak. Because again, now we have 52 minutes um, left. Use I statements. Use I statements. Don't generalize. Don't generalize. Speak in first person and try to speak from your own experiences when you go up to that mic. Yeah, we don't want to hear any, well, they do that, and, you know, I believe this. No, I believe. 
that this happens in my particular community situation, in my classroom, whatever it is. Three, be a learner and a teacher. Take risks, ask questions. If there's anything that someone says that you need some clarity on, feel free to ask what that thing um, is. However, when you step up to that mic and ask a question, be sure that you are um, thinking about, is this question to help gain clarity? Is this question um, um, being posed in order to help bring something into this space or this question is there to disrupt our process, right? Um, four, assume good, oh, I did that, okay. Assume good intent and take responsibility for impact. So we all know that we are coming from different places, spaces, experiences, backgrounds. We're all coming into space from a different point of view. Um, and I like to assume, I always like to assume that people are coming and when they speak and when they think and when they engage with us, it's from the best place, right? I hope so. I mean, this is jazz, right, y'all? Y'all are all good people. Um, however, when that doesn't happen, when that doesn't, when that doesn't happen, when it, when there is, when there are words that are said that may impact someone differently, take responsibility for that. I apologize. I didn't mean it in that way, and this is how, you know. But you know what? Going back to the I statements, that helps with the clarity. Um, my favorite one, expect and accept a lack of closure. Again, we ain't gonna solve the world's issues. We're not gonna solve the issues in jazz today <laughs> at this session. But the, again, this is just a beginning, just a beginning of a dialogue that I hope that will continue. And then the last one is, what is learned here leaves here. What is learned here leaves here. In order to do our job as participants, let's remember that the conversation begins here, that these conversations should be ongoing and continuous. Um, just because you attended this forum, don't check that box off. I'm like, oh yeah, I've done it. Yes, I've done the work. You have not. You haven't. You have not. So make sure that you are if you need to, take some notes so you can take this conversation back into your own communities. Um, all right. I'm ready. Are y'all ready? So let's open up the floor. And with the mindset that the question that we're trying to answer today, that we're working towards answering today, is what do we need in order to create equitable spaces for women in the jazz industry. What do we need in order to create equitable spaces for women in the jazz industry? And if you all could put that question up on the board so that we stay grounded with that, I wanna open up the floor. Mm -hmm. Yes. community. Thank you. Okay, would you mind going up to the microphone? Hi. Um, yeah, I'm producer of the Northampton Jazz Festival and also was a teacher for many years. And I, starting young, starting girls to feel empowered, especially starting music at a young age, and what do we see in our school systems? They're cutting music in the arts programs early. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the first thing to go. Yeah. And we've been fortunate in our community that um, they're appreciative of the arts enough that we've been able to start a program in the middle school and one in the high school, and it's just great seeing young women feel, yeah, I can play saxophone, I can play trombone, I can play trumpet, you know? It's great, instead of just flute and piano. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really, um, I'm all about um, music and especially jazz education. I have a six-year-old son that is in it, um, for real. And I think that, you know, starting, starting young people at an early age in the music, especially 
girls, little girls, is so important. But I want us to think about the environments that allow those little girls to be to have that platform. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you want to go to the microphone? And we're going to be taking notes. Um, so some of this information is going to be synthesized and, and put up on the screens. So, um, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm saying to myself, what do we need in order to create equitable spaces? So we have to think about who's in control That's right. of creating the equitable spaces. And, and then we need to educate them with the f starting with the fact that women can be as passionate and as marketable and as um, engaging to an audience as men. But if the women, like the, the other woman said, if the women, if the girls don't feel that self-empowerment, then the passion doesn't come out because those in power, whether they're women or men or um, who have the spaces, are thinking about, you know, the financial aspect. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that. So we have to, as musicians, we have to give them what they want, but to acknowledge the potential that women have, I think is really important. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That energetic thing. I 100% um, agree with that. It's about acknowledging not only the potential, but the expertise and intelligence um, and ability that women possess. Yes. Hi, my name is Irene Chang, and I, uh, my daughter is a saxophonist um, and jazz musician, Grace Kelly. And we've talked about this so many times with many people, parents, and people like J.B. Dyer, who studied Sisters in Jazz for mm -hmm. um, IAJE. And I would like to ask anybody who's in a position to hire a clinician for high school, middle school, and college to hire female clinicians. Yes. She is oftentimes the very first one they've ever, ever had. Yeah. And when I'm right now, I'm researching all the high school jazz bands, directors in Massachusetts to reach out to um, for specific concerts because I want to bring high school and middle school students to see the live acoustic jazz big band. The thing is, there are very few teachers, first of all, who are female. And yeah. you go to the um, band practice band rooms, there's no female poster of whatsoever. You know, there's yeah. a Duke Ellington and everybody else, but there's no female picture. And I think when Grace does clinic in high school and middle school, the girls are so excited yeah. to see someone playing saxophone who looks like them. And I think that's where it should start because the education being the one that, you know, they don't have to tell, sell tickets and you don't have to bring in famous people. First of all, there's not a lot of budget anyways. Why not bring in female a clinician to show them, hey, girls play instrument too. It doesn't That's have right. to be all male. And start out that way they can connect, first of all, and they feel proud to playing an instrument that is not traditionally male instrument. Because I've always thought there is no gender in instrument. Why does no. girls have to play <laughs> soft? And why can't they play drums and saxophones and trumpets? You know? So I ask everyone who's in that position to bring in female clinicians for middle school and high school, of course, colleges and festivals. Yeah, thank I think you. that, thank you. I think that is a really tangible thing that we can put into practice very, very easily because I can tell you um, as a young woman, not seeing um, who I wanna be or who I could be in the world and modeled in front of me and our educators and our teachers, um, if we don't see it, we can't believe it. You know, and that's why I think it's so important. Um, so when you come up to the mic, yeah, please say your name, where you're from. Let, uh, let's, get, let's get a little um, uh, who you are before you ask your question. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, John W. Comerford from uh, the Jazz Bakery in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm on the board there. I have some management responsibilities. What I was thinking about, because we're about ready to embark on this at the bakery, is um, telling stories. 
And um, we're working with, uh, or I work uh, closely with Ruth Price, who founded the Jazz Bakery uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. We're getting ready to start telling her story. Um, we're working with a terrific um, new millennial marketing person, Lindsay Starr. And she's like, you know, we gotta get Ruth's story out into the world because she's been a presenter for so long in LA in a, you know, area which has chiefly been dominated by men in terms of, you know, jazz presentation. Yeah. And um, we're gonna be um, starting that process with Gretchen Parlato, doing a conversation with Ruth and filming that. And um, that's just a beginning, you know, to her story. But I think stories also as a filmmaker, I made a documentary, Icons Among Us, Jazz in the Present Tense. And we spoke to, you know, Tinica Post uh, Postma, Anat Cohen, Diane Reeves. I mean, the list was long. So I've sort of spent time in that pool mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I think personal narratives are a real key, too. I would want, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that comment. I would 100% agree. As I mentioned, when, you know, we gave the land acknowledgement, telling people's authentic narratives, letting those stories be heard is takes us one step closer in order to in, in 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 order to bridge a gap of knowing and not knowing because there are so many examples out here. Yes. Hi, um Adrian DeVoer, presenter, Flat at Fifth Jazz Vespers series, Newark, New Jersey. I just wanna say a couple things. One is even as women sometimes uh, even as a presenter, I know when we do our programming we try to balance it with someone female and someone male and we, to show that we don't have it geared toward one gender at the expense of the another. Also, in regards to um, Grace Kelly's mother, um, she's talking about expanding it into high school and middle school. I think you need to do jazz education and in full disclosure, I'm a graduate student in early childhood education. And I think you have to expand that further back into elementary and mm -hmm. early childhood. So mm -hmm. to show that kids really start getting into music very, very young. Yes. And then they connect uh, through that. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think that um, here at Jazz at Lincoln Center, they're doing an awesome job with the Weebop program, mm -hmm. introducing young, very young people. Um, into into the music and understanding that it is for everyone. It's not a, a gendered music. Some people can't pick up instruments and others can. Everyone um, is able to do that. Hey, hey, my friend, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Akash Mithal, and I'm a saxophone player and educator. And I conduct a jazz ensemble actually in this neighborhood at Face the Music. We have very few female participants uh, a lot of male participants, and uh, we have a challenge in keeping female participants in it, and a challenge in recruiting them. And I recently attended a, another panel a couple days ago where we were talking about safer spaces, and the question I wanted to pose to the room and to you, uh, as a band leader and as an educator, what do women and young women need to feel safe in male-dominated spaces. Mm. And I think we're starting to talk about some of those things in terms of representation, having female guest artists, having even posters on the wall, earlier education. Um, but I think, the, at least for me, what would be helpful is the more we can expand that list, uh, there are probably things on there that I myself am not mm -hmm. thinking about in terms of making it a safe space for young women to participate. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And I'd love to see some people come down and, and try to answer that question. Um, me personally, um, I don't think as we are, are really beginning in this work as, as a field, as a, as, a, as a country, you know, um, we can't create a safe space overnight. It's not going to happen. I don't believe in creating safe spaces because that takes a lot a lot, of, a lot of things. Um, but I do think that we can create spaces where people feel comfortable, but that, that, depend, that is, is very much dependent on everybody in that space uh, adhering to a certain commitment of how we're going to be in the room. Um, is, would anyone here, I know you, that you're there, would you like to answer um, Akasha's question? Anyway, yes, okay. 
Hi, my name is Nathaniel Cadet. Um, I'm a student at the University of Buffalo. Um, as it pertains to that question about what do women and young women need, I mean, first of all, I'm a man, so I can't say exactly what they need, but from my perspective. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up around girls, right? Both of my sisters are musicians. My older sister is a singer. My younger sister, she wanted to be a drummer like me, but she ended up playing violin and stuff because she was pushed towards the more. She was socialized mm -hmm, to do exactly, in that way. Precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing that me and her constantly talk about is not waiting for someone else to create that space for you. That's right. You have to understand that you need to be comfortable in who you are as a person That's and walk right. into that space and understand that you need to take it over yourself. You know, you can't walk in and feel like, oh, I feel safe here, right? So now I'm going to express myself. Right. If, you, if you're waiting for yourself to feel safe, you're never going to express yourself. That's right. So you got to be able to take that step and understand who you are as a person and understanding that if you don't take that step, no one's going to give you the opportunity. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's okay. all I got to say about that. Oh yeah, I'm also um, I'm also a student at the Love Supreme School of Music in Buffalo, New York. So I'm sorry, say that again. I am also a teacher, a okay. music teacher at the Love Supreme School of Music in Buffalo, New York, and actually some of my best students are females. So, all right. Yeah, and I teach Shouting out Buffalo, so. New York. <laughs> Who's speaking? This oh, is so yes. connected. I'm, my name's Judith Lorick. I'm a, I'm a jazz vocalist. I live here in New York. And this is all connected. I mean, we're not going to get young women ready to stand up and say, I'm strong, and I can deal with this, and I can go into this space and feel safe if we don't start very young. Yeah. And nurturing these young women so that they do feel strong and powerful and can step into that power. Mm. In my other life, I'm also an executive coach, and most of my work working with women is helping them step into their power mm -hmm. because we've been socialized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another side to this, and I was having a conversation with an all-male band the other day, and uh, we were talking about women in jazz and how do we nurture women in jazz. And um, it starts with the individual, and it starts with every one of us as band leaders also do we hire women into our bands? Or is our first thought about the men that we know who play mm. well? Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the guys said, yeah, well, if, if, if a woman plays well, then she's in the band. You know, but don't ask me to hire a woman just because she's a woman. I said, nobody's asking me to do that. Mm. But what kind of environment do you create? And when you go on tour, do women feel safe going on tour with you when you're sitting around and telling dirty jokes and making comments about how the women look and all that? Are you conscious? about your own behavior as a band leader when you do hire a woman. That's how we create the space. Yeah. OK, thank you. Can yes. I say something about Yes, that? absolutely. My name is Akua Dixon. Hi, I'm Akua. a cellist. And um, for decades, I've worked with men in bands. Mm. And one of the things I would say that would really help is if it was possible to not just have one woman in the band, <laughs> OK? We're not I trying to tokenize with, in. Uh, I've traveled uh, with big bands mm -hmm. all over the world. And in most cases, in a lot of different styles of music, I've been the only one. Yeah. I had a sister that also played violin. So for many years, there were times when it was two of us. My first professional gig was at the Apollo with James Brown. Oh, okay? wow. He hired a string quartet. This is the late 60s, mm -hmm. OK? Um, my father let my sister and I do the gig, but he was there to pick us up after the show was over, mm -hmm. OK? When I walked in and they take us to the band room, OK, that one experience of the five minutes or less that I spent in that room let me know that I will never go in a band room ever again <laughs> in life as a woman. Yeah. You know? Um, when I started working, even doing Broadway and shows like that, there were no women. So the change to bring women in has been slow and helpful, but it needs to be more than one woman in a band to be able to feel safe and comfortable. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, thank you for that, Akua. I think that, that that change that is happening has been happening is slow. But in order for us to progress, it has to be methodical and it has to be intentional. It can't just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get this, you know, one female, and then what happens? Um, yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Laura Gentry. I'm a jazz promoter in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on for what's been talked about. We've talked about getting to, to girls early in schools, but anybody who has the opportunity to get in front of children, also think about churches, community centers, yeah. arts centers, um, recreation centers. Yes. Uh, one of the organizations that I work with in Cincinnati, we do an educational outreach program in churches, um, Cincinnati recreation centers, um, community art centers, mm -hmm. anywhere that we can go that we can get in front of kids. Um, think about those opportunities too. Um, I'm not a musician, I'm a promoter. For any woman in here who does something, if you're a musician or if you do something that supports the arts, never forget about the impact that you can have. I get up and talk in front of students and in front of organizations. And I didn't realize that my story of how I've been a promoter in the Midwest, in Cincinnati, Ohio, not the greatest place <laughs> to promote jazz. <laughs> and I'm also an accountant. My story, it's kind of weird, but if you tell your story, you never know who you're going to impact and empower. That's right. You may think your story might not be that important because you're not singing or you're not playing an instrument. But I tell people, I told Willard Jenkins, um, I'm the woman that gets shit done. <laughs> so you need to know about my story so you can be empowered to be that same woman. Because right. artists need you just as much as we need them. And I, I just want to say thank you to this lady right here. Because when I started promoting 20 years ago, you were the first person that I talked to. I didn't know anybody that did anything like what I did. Oh, that's how we empower one another. You know, I want to speak to your point about um, community. Yesterday, uh, my organization honored um, an 89-year-old arts manager, Bess Pruitt. I'm going to bring her name into the space because she's managed uh, a number of jazz artists as well. Um, and she spoke to her. She spoke to us about how you nurture and empower women um, and artists in general. And she said, it's about tapping into your community. You gotta start small and then branch out. That's the first step. So I just wanna pass on that piece of, that piece of knowledge that I got from that octogenarian um, whom I'm so grateful to know. There's some, uh, no. Oh, you've been waiting. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, I, I'll try to be short. Um, my name is Marina Albero. Yes. I come from Barcelona, but I live in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I was born in a musician's family, so I don't remember my first gig. I have stories for hours about, you know, being a musician and a woman, um, but I'm not going to focus on that. Um, what I would like for all of us to think about is how words impact in your bodies. Um, when we, I'm going to go to the very first question, and actually, when you said um, how we create these spaces, what do we need? Um, I think a very easy one, it's thinking about words. For example, I'm going to give you an example of my own way of thinking about that. When people come to me and tell me that I'm gonna, they are going to give me an advice, I feel already that I'm less than they are. And I'm a teacher and an educator. I've been teaching mm. at Cornish in Seattle. I'm, I'm, teaching, I don't know, I've been at the Garfield High School retreat teaching them. Um, so one is, uh, even if one were teaching or we are parenting, I'm also a mom of a musician. She's a student at the new school, uh, vocal jazz, which it's another thing that we could talk about how the vocal program seems to be less demanding um, than any other instrument, instruments. Uh, but well, there's many <laughs> things. Right. Uh, so I changed the word advice by insight. Insight. Yeah. And I change the word help by support. I only need help if I'm about to die and I need a surgery. <laughs> it's true. It's true, guys. I need support. And as a mom, my kids don't want my help or my advice. Yeah. And the word I'm looking for to sap from, and I would love if you have any <laughs> ideas, is the word mistake. It's another word I would like to change for another word. So I'm just, I would say that language, and in this aspect, we are all humans, and we all feel these sort of things more or less in the same way, men, women, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, people with one religion or another. Um, 
try these things, mm -hmm. changing the language, because I believe the language is also a heritage from patriarchy. Yes. So maybe changing the language, especially always on the tiny people, but we need to start doing it all the time. Yeah. So I would change language to kind of create that, you know, that's, and you know, oh, you're killing it, oh, badass, blah, 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 blah. So all these things, I don't know, we, we, maybe we could keep evolving. I hope we can. Yes, Thank you. Yes, yes. Gracias por su pregunta. And um, language is important. Language matters. Language matters. Just that slight, um, that slight change. You said change advice to advice. Insight. I'm sorry. <laughs> advice to advice. Advice to insight. Change help to support. Write that down, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's your resource right there. Yes. Well, adding to this uh, very supportive discussion where I'm getting a lot of insight, uh, <laughs> I uh, want to go back to uh, the beginning of this uh, discussion when you brought in the Indians and um, to our being thankful and recognizing that we're here because they, they were here, and uh, we need to acknowledge that. And to continue to be thankful to them, I understand that the Iroquois uh, had a formation of, of governance whereby they would get in a circle. It wasn't hierarchical, it was circular. Yes. And so that already, that formation actually leveled literally leveled the playing field. Mm -hmm. And um, in the, all the discussions, when people come together w related to uh, their work uh, in the jazz uh, genre, there's no reason that uh, the circular form cannot be used uh, as they figure out who does what and, you know, such and such. Uh, and um, so, yeah. That's my contribution. I'm, I'm Jean Golden, by the way, and I'm, I, I love jazz and all the arts, and every now and then I can sing a little tune. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Jean. Yeah, um, that point about how Native Americans um, did their um, building in community via circle. It's one practice that, that WOGA practices every single time. So this is a little foreign to me. For me to be up here, this is not my place. For me to be up here and you to be there. Um, usually we are communicating in circle. And one thing that we can, uh, that we can learn from uh, uh, many indigenous um, communities is that um, in that circle, many of the women took the leadership role. Mm -hmm. and let's not forget that. Let's not forget why. I'm up here because I know you've been standing okay. there for a minute. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, my name is James. I'm a trombone player, and I work at the Howard Gilman Foundation. I went to Eastman about 20 years ago as a jazz student. And at that time, there were zero uh, female faculty on staff in the mm -hmm. jazz faculty. And you know, I just went on to look and see what's it look like now. It is still the same. same. And I'm not, you know, I am calling out Eastman, but this is my way of loving Eastman, is yes. to say, hire some women on your jazz faculty. As students, yes. you know, I would say it was almost similar, maybe two or three female students, and I was thinking about what it would take, like why you would want to go into that environment, into such a male-dominated environment, um, when it doesn't really seem like they necessarily even want you to be there. That's right. And so <clears throat> there's no shortage of female musicians in the world. Um, so I feel like what are we, how are we signaling that we actually want women in jazz because women don't need jazz. Jazz needs women. <laughs> so, you know, when we look at all these various places, what are they doing to really show that they yeah. genuinely want women to be a part of what they're doing? Yes. That, that reframe, thank you so much for that comment. That reframing is so critical. It's so critical. Women don't need jazz. Jazz needs women. That changes the game right there. That changes the game. Um, there was something that you said, I just lost my, my train of thought. Um, oh, geez. It was something really important. <laughs> it was something really important. Let me, oh, look, I got into some notes right here. Um, Think about words, hired women on jazz faculties, blah, 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 blah. 
I'm going to come back to it. But thank you so much for that comment. Yes. Good morning. I'm Amber Weeks. I'm a vocalist from Los Angeles. I'm very grateful for this conversation, and my head is going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> so an insight that I have is that I'm a graduate of an all-women's college, okay. right, where we were empowered to speak. But what happens to me on a gig or, like, I just finished uh, an album, um, when I'm in the studio, I find myself very much acquiescing to whatever's going on with the producer. And my, la my current album has three producers. All of them had different styles. What I'm learning that empowers me, that what puts me back in the space of being powerful, is being with men who really invite me to say something. Hmm. And so I would ask the men to be a little bit more aware that given my age, I was raised to be polite. Mm. And I may have a whole lot of thought and feeling about something, trust me, most of the time I do. It would be wonderful for this to be a two-sided activity mm -hmm. where women find their voice and at the same time men be aware that women have a voice. Because do I, jazz, any form of music, is really an expression. And if we can all allow ourselves to have our expression, I think it would be deeper and richer. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Um, one of the things, like, you are, you are leading us in the direction that I wanted to, to kind of conclude with, but I'll say it now. Um, and what we spoke about reframing, one of the things is to start to reframe patriarchy as an issue for everyone. It's not just about women. It's about how men have to change their, their thinking and bring their fellow man alongside. Yes. Hello, my name is Beatriz Ortega. I'm coming from Spain, Madrid, <clears throat> and I'm the director and producer for Femina Jazz. It's a festival focused on women in jazz. Mm -hmm. After our research that started in 2014 about the, uh, the percentage of women programming different festivals around the world, we just realized that we needed to do something, and our way to do something was to create this festival, which proposes a series of concerts leading by women, uh, both instrumentists and vocalists. Um, we propose a contest for young women composers, and we propose different panels and conferences that um, uh, with professionals in the industry and the community to talk about the issues that we and the community has um, for women to be there at the same place as men have been forever in the jazz yeah. industry. Yeah. I think that's a great model that we can use. Do you, do you all think so? It's a tangible takeaway that we can have in order how we're going to model being in our own community. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go up here. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, this is so fantastic. My name is Tracy McMullen. Uh, I'm an instructor uh, of jazz at Bowdoin College. And I'm really taking a page from the wonderful Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, started by Terry Lynn Carrington. I'm just mm -hmm. so excited that we have this model. And I feel like things have really, we all have permission now to just really clearly say, and this is what we're doing at Bowdoin. We're going to teach jazz um, with an, you know, an awareness of gender equity. So that's what that institute is doing. It's like if you want to learn jazz and you want to learn jazz in this particular way that's emphasizing gender equity and equity generally, this is a place. And so this is what we're doing at Bowdoin. And I think part of what that does then is we start like just how you started. Like these are the implicit sort of values of our culture. You know, you speak, we, we take classes in public speaking, but we don't take classes in virtuosic listening, mm, let's say. So yes. kind of privileging, um, <laughs> you know, so we can say, so these are the values. And also, you know, bringing up, like if you're the type of person that will talk first and, and all the time, maybe try to not do that. And if you're a person that tends to not speak out, maybe try to do that. And so that we're all creating an environment that's like, these are the types of things that we're teaching and learning and valuing and as part of it. And so I think slowly people can sort of recognize, oh, I have some space here to, to do this and, you know, to change my behavior, whether I'm talking all the time or I'm not. 
and just making that part of what we're learning when we're learning jazz. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I think that um, it's going back to a point that the young woman made over here about the ways in which women are socialized. And I just want to pick up on that, asking for permission. You know, we're socialized, um, many of us, especially women, to ask for permission in order to do something, to gain access to something. And I have learned, and I'm, I'm not, um, you know, close to the wisdom or the experience of my grandmother and my elders, but I don't ask for permission anything, for anything anymore. <laughs> I ask for forgiveness after the fact. <laughs> and do what I have to do, and we women should do what we need to do in order to be in the spaces that we need to be in. Yes. Good morning. My Good morning. name is Shirley Martin. I represent the Skip Pearson Jazz Foundation and also UNESCO. Uh, we are doing International Jazz Day in New York City on April 29th and 30th. Um, I want to say that I would hate for any of us to leave this hall and not recognize the women that have come before us. Thank you. I'm thinking of Blanche Calloway, who was an excellent band leader uh, like her brother. I'm also thinking of the women organizations that were put together in the 1930s and 40s of uh, women ensembles, which would be Sweetheart of Women. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of all the other groups. So historically, women have always had a very strong position in the jazz community. Somewhere along the way, we lost that at the early 20th century. We're going to have to get that back. Mm -hmm. But it's not like we haven't been here before. And, that's right. and what I will tell you is until women become the decision makers, nothing will change in any industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they have to be in a position to make the kind of decisions that will give us the equity that we need. Yeah. Right now, today, in the public sector, I'm a public servant, and I can tell you it's harder today to raise money as a woman than it ever has been before. Mm. Why is that? So I would suggest that the mores of our country have changed, and we haven't made the course direction that we need to to make sure that we're in line with those mores. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, it goes back to making sure that we are always grounded in history. We are always grounded in history, that narrative, making sure to share narratives, because sometimes this country has a short memory. Short, short memory. And a selective one as well. That's right. So thank you for bringing those women and those organizations into the space. Um, I'm going to go here, yes. Hi, my name's Alexis Cole. I'm a jazz vocalist in New York and I'm the faculty at SUNY Purchase. And I just want a show of hands, how many people came from the GEN conference? I'm not on the board of GEN or anything, but um, for the fir I've been going to that conference since I was in college, I mean, when it was IAJE, and for the first time, a super intentional effort was made to really bring women into the space and, and uh, just from an ageist perspective too, younger women even into the space. And for the very first time, I felt like I really belonged there, like I had a voice. The iconography was all women, young women. I could tell by their drawings. <laughs> young women jazz musicians. And, um, and the stages were, even the main stages were equally shared between women and men. And I thought, wow, if you just landed from Mars and came to the Gen Conference, you would <laughs> think that women and men were equally represented in jazz. <laughs> and I, I just, in, in a, just a few short days, my whole mentality changed about my place in the music and in the industry. And I just wanted to say what an oversized impact mm. that things like this c can have and, and making those very, which what I'm sure were very intentional changes yeah. at Jen. And um, just uh, we, we need to keep doing what we're doing and, and realizing that, that we can make fast change just by, by um, having our intent in the right place. It's all about intention. It's all about intentionality. Thank you for that, for that comment. And it's not just about waiting for the opportunities for these um, platforms to be created for us to come and come together. It's about creating those platforms. Yes, young man here. Good morning, my name is Marcus Lowell. I'm with the Pappy Martin Legacy Jazz Collective and with the Love Supreme School of Music, Buffalo, New York. I'm okay. a jazz pianist and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will try to be as coherent as possible as many fireworks are going through my brain right now, but there are so <laughs> many things that I want to say. 
Um, first and foremost, I think we need to be intentional when trying to create equity, right? And you know, to the point of the difference between equality and equ equity. I think in any um, um, situation where two factions have uh, inherent equity that exists, societally speaking, I think it's important to be intentional about representation, yeah. right? And and um, to the point of this lady, I think who spoke earlier and said that we don't need a token woman in the bandstand, yeah. right? Just sitting there to say, oh, there it goes, we've got one, equality, that's, yay, that's everybody, right? right? That's, not, that's not the point. Um, one of the ways I think we can do this is in celebrating the legacies of jazz musicians that have gone before. Somebody like Hazel Scott, mm -hmm. I bruised the entire internet, can't find a movie about her mm -hmm. anywhere. But if we're talking about technical proficiency, that's right. I mean, come on, there are very few men that we know yes. that have had this much proficiency and aren't represented you know, on the grand stage. Somebody like Art Tatum, you could, I'm from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I've known about Art Tatum since I was 12. I didn't know a word of English. Mm -hmm. See, but I never knew about Hazel Scott until I was probably like, 24, mm -hmm. you know? And so those things are not represented. In jazz education, for example, I'm a jazz educator, and I have young women that I teach, you know, some of them 10, 12. When you teach them about great musicians, teach them about great women musicians yeah, so they yeah. can see themselves yeah. as people who potentially can become sort of these people. So I think representation today, right, yeah. on, the, on the bandstand, but also the recalling of the legacies of people that have come before and to, to whom people can aspire today. That's Thank you. right. Aí, Bobo. <laughs> I will say, yes, absolutely, representation matters. Um, but I am not an advocate for representation for representation's sake. Um, I'm not an advocate for inclusion for inclusion's sake. It is about putting those people in, um, those women into leadership roles um, when you bring them inside of your organization, whether that be in the bandstand or that be behind the scenes and, and booking those festivals and booking those um, nightclubs. Where are we going? Did, we, did you speak yeah, already? Yeah, I, I wanted to okay. bring up a very well, important thing. First of all, we can, something we can all do, your daughter, your granddaughter, your niece, all of us can have a huge impact by, one, um, bringing them to uh, uh, gigs that are headlined by female band leaders, okay? We can all do that. And if you can't find it in locally, um, then ask the venue to book female-led uh, jazz group. Advocacy and is important, yeah. It's, it's all, you know, like Grace was playing, I, my daughter is Grace Kelly, a uh, saxophonist, and Grace was playing, and there was a family brought, you know, fourth graders is when they choose instrument, and she was gonna choose a flute because her mother said, oh, it's easy. But you know, after seeing Grace, she's gonna pick saxophone. So I'm not saying that every woman, sh kids be should become a jazz musician. You know, like it, it, I was, I'm uh, responding. Women don't need jazz. Jazz need women. That's if right. you want girls to see jazz show, you gotta bring in jazz female musicians. And I think same thing with the radio. If you don't hear any female. Uh, music in radio and jazz radio, NPR, whatever it is, again, ask for them and go take your niece and granddaughter to uh, live shows with female musicians, yeah. not just singers. So I ask you, all of you can actually make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Advocacy is so important. Sometimes we get caught up that, um, well, I can't do it by myself. Like, I need Yes, we, we need our communities in order to help advocate, but the power of one, have y'all heard that? Yeah. Call your radio stations, call your performing arts centers and say, listen, I haven't seen any women on your program for the past, never. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? Let's go to this gentleman in the back here. Yeah, hi, my name is Afama Funa. I'm a musician, but I'm also a leadership psychology specialist and also have an organization that does racial equity work uh, using mindfulness mm -hmm. and um, social psychology. Um, I just wanted to bring something briefly into the room, just to bring it into the room, because it is a very salient piece of this presentation, and that is the intersectionality between race and gender. Absolutely. Because I'm sure, I'm, I'm a male, I'm not a female, and I can't speak from experience other than the uh, women that I've worked with in music, but um, 
I've heard stories about how black women are treated within music versus white women. Absolutely. So it's a really important thing to keep in mind because as you gather as a gender, you can be all women in one space, but then there's still that intersectionality about how are the white women treated in the space versus the women of color in the space. That's right. So yeah. I just wanted to bring that up. No, appreciate right. that. And I said that I know that it was going to come up. And if I didn't bring it up, thank you for bringing it up. So intersectionality, uh, a term coined, a concept and a term coined by a black woman, a legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, will bring her name into the space. And it's about how these intersect, how identities, um, race and gender, intersect and impact different people in different ways. So that's absolutely something that we have to think about, um, not only in jazz and music and the arts, in the world. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name's Barbara Collin with the Collin Artists Agency. And I just kind of wanted to share a little bit about my story because it hopefully uh, relates to what people have been saying. I'm also uh, on the faculty at the Musicians Institute in LA. I have a little cold, so excuse me. Um, but I remember I initially wanted to be a jazz flute player. And there were, at that point, no females, no very few, if any, female jazz musicians that I could have as a role model. And I remember going at age 21 to the Keystone Corner and seeing Patrice Russian. Mm -hmm. playing straight ahead jazz. Yeah. That was the first woman I had seen live. And very inspirational, but very not other role models around. So I kind of put my dream of being a musician aside, ended up as a jazz, uh, working in a national jazz agency. And was thrown into that, I was offered a job, um, within two weeks, there were two men running the company. Within two weeks, they said, would you like to start booking? Try booking. Mm -hmm. And I am so grateful for them because that doesn't happen very often, mm -hmm. particularly then. Mm -hmm. So one of my first, the first artists I worked with was the Akiyoshi Tabakan Big Band with Toshiko Akiyoshi mm -hmm. leading. So. That kind of that's that really kickstarted my career. So I wanted to say, if there are males in the industry, please give women opportunities to learn, and not just answer phones, be assistants, etc. Yeah. Please yeah. keep that in mind. Yes. You know, and as I've gone, it's <clears throat> it's been a journey. I have I started my own company, um, jazz artists and other genres, and there. Weren't any, there have not been many jazz, female jazz agents um, on the West Coast. When I came to New York, I discovered people like Karen Kennedy, Gail Boyd, and it was like wonderful. There are women in this industry, yeah. strong women. So, you know, just men just need to be mindful. A lot of the major jazz festivals are run by men. And they need to also keep in mind that women need opportunities, you know, support a female agent. Yes. Look at my artists. You know, it's, it's like a battle. It's been a, it's been a long battle. But I'm Thank glad you. to see a lot more women in the industry and musicians. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it is a wonderful place to end because we have to. <laughs> <laughs> because we have to, but I appreciate all of the voices um, that were brought into the room and all of your insights, all of your, your insights um, into the space. That last comment um, brings, us, brings us back to um, what I wanted to kind of drive home is that, you know, we have to reframe patriarchy as an issue for everyone. You know, again, going back to women don't need jazz, jazz needs women. Men have to take responsibility. It's not a women's issue. Men have to take responsibility for this work for themselves um, and challenge the other men around them. Um, 
And as writer, one of my favorite writers and activists and, and scholars, Bell Hooks, reminds us is that um, patriarchy has no gender, and it's going to take all of us to combat it. So thank you so much for being in the space. Again, what's learned here leaves here. Please go back into your communities. Go back outside of this room and continue this dialogue. We thank you so much for your presence.